Marilyn, as many of you all know, uh, has been MP for Swansea East since 2015 and was re-elected in both 2017 and 2019. Um, she became the first deputy leader of Welsh Labour in 2018. She's taken on a lot of front bench, ben, front, front bench roles um, and she now sits as a backbencher and chairs the old party parliamentary group on gambling related harm. And she'll tell you a bit about uh, some of the work she's been doing in, in the video. Hello, my name is Carolyn Harris and I'm the Member of Parliament for Swansea East and I'm the Chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Gambling Related Harms. Prior to that, I was the Chair of the APPG, All Party Parliamentary Group, on Fixed Odds Betting Terminals. And I'm absolutely delighted to be able to speak to you today um, I know that you're in Bristol and that you were going to be looking at um, gambling related harms. I'm absolutely delighted about. We're at the point in Westminster where we have firmly put gambling and gambling related harm on the political agenda. And that has not been an easy task. One of our fine speakers today is a young man called Matt Sarp Cousin. And the reason why I became involved in this is because of Matt. And Matt came to see me many moons ago when I was first elected in 2015 to talk about the dangers of fixed odds betting terminals. And when Matt first brought the subject to me, as much as I was interested in what he was telling me, because it was talking about um, a section of society whose vulnerability to these machines was in very often many cases leaving them vulnerable, and in some occasion, I'm leaving them desperate and to the point where they have taken their own lives. And whilst I was really interested, I needed to know that that was relevant to my constituency. And I remember saying goodbye to Matt and saying, I'll get in touch if I need to talk more. It was coming up to Christmas and that Christmas I went home and for some reason, a young man came to my office and said that he'd lost his wallet and it was two days before Christmas and he had no presents for his children and he had no food for Christmas. And I did then what I always do is try to be as practical as possible. And I went around all the supermarkets and local charities and I managed to get him a Christmas in the form of food and we managed to get toys for his children. And I personally delivered this to his home. I had a conversation with this young man, said goodbye and off I went. And on Christmas day, I was taken cooked meals to the pub where there were two elderly gentlemen who didn't have anywhere to go for Christmas dinner and this young man was playing on a machine in the pub and I spoke to him three possibly four times uh, and every time I spoke to him he was completely ob oblivious to my presence and my voice and I said to my husband does that man come in here very often and my husband said no not normally he's normally in the bookies but they shut today and everything that Matt had told me about suddenly was not just in my constituency, it was literally on my doorstep. And I pursued the conversation with my husband further and talked to him about what other stories he was aware of. Were there other people in the pub who were using the bookies, which was next door, on a regular basis? And he regaled to me some really terrifying stories of people being made redundant at 12 o'clock spending 7,000 by four, by four o'clock in the afternoon. And how people in the pub were quite often desperate because they'd spent huge amount of money on the machines. Then he started telling me about how many youngsters he knew who actually had gambling apps on their phone and how dangerous they were. So when I came back to London, I spoke to Matt and said, Matt, I really wanna help you to do this. And that's where the Fixed Odds Betting Terminals, APPG was born. And from that, despite Everyone thinking that we wouldn't do it, despite the industry arrogantly assuming that we wouldn't do it, we beat them. And we got the stakes on FOBTs reduced from £100 every 20 seconds to £2 every 20 seconds. And the reason why we won is because we used the real life experiences of vulnerable people who are caught in that trap of addiction. And whilst we were doing this inquiry on FOBTs, we heard a lot from people who had a problem with online gambling and how dangerous it was and how prevalent and, and 
the the ability of the industry to to get into their brain and to get into their lives and every aspect of their social media and their communication they were able to invade almost like a cancer and get in there and constantly keep these people wanting more grooming them to spend money they didn't have you know leading them down the path of becoming transfixed with machines that were able to dictate their entire reason reasoning and once we went on the FOBTs, we decided that we would look at gambling related harm in the sense of what other areas of gambling were causing a problem. And we discovered very quickly what we already knew, which was online gambling was a massive, massive, massive problem. Now, when we started talking about this in 2015, the industry had a total dominance over the subject. Nobody talked about it in Westminster. There were promises of a a triannual review and there were promises that they would look at things and there were promises that would change things. But this legislation which allowed all this to happen was born in 2007, sorry, 2005, two years before an iPad was even invented. So what we allowed then in, in liberalising the gambling laws was taken full advantage of by the industry which had a digital aspect and were able to completely overtake an analog piece of legislation and run amok with it and when i say the wild west you cannot imagine how much goes on legally because the legislation is not up to scratch so we were banging away and banging away and banging away and eventually we led the government to do an inquiry and we're now at the point where we have a white paper which is a um, a discussion paper, if you like, a government discussion paper, which will lead to either changes in legislation or will lead to the government enacting legislation they already have access to, to change the environment, which will hopefully reduce harms and bring the industry into um, some kind of place where there's a lot more accountability and where they're actually made to pay for the damage they cause. So. I don't know what will happen with the white paper in the end. I just know that organisations like you were talking about this in 2015. I just know there's a lot of organisations out there, charities and voluntary groups who are doing stuff that they weren't doing in 2015. And I just know that there are people out there, millions of people out there who in 2015 did not have a problem with gambling. In 2023, they do. And we, I'm confident that we as an APPG, people like Matt's our cousin, campaigners who have worked tirelessly to bring this onto the agenda, can be very proud that going forward from now, something that will happen that will change the environment and the world around gambling and gambling related harm. So whatever work you do, I want to support you. Whatever I can do to talk up what you're doing, I want to do. And whatever you think that you have to hop, that you can offer me to help me in my mission in this place, the House of Commons, to actually make that gambling environment a more healthier, sustainable place for everyone, then I want to hear from you because I want us all to work together. I want us to make sure that going forward, there will not be as many victims. There will be recordable outcomes. There will be valuable research that we can cite as a reason why the industry cannot be allowed to continue the way it is. So have a wonderful conference. I'm very much hoping when you are listening to this that I'm going to be laying on a lounge by a pool on my annual holiday. So, you know, I'll be thinking of you, but you might not want to think about me laying on a lounge um, by the side of a pool with possibly... Um, um, a tequila in my hand but it's been absolutely wonderful to speak to you have a wonderful time have a great con conference and listen to Matt's up cousin he knows what he's talking about bye brilliant um i think uh, i think karen's done a wonderful job of of talking about some of the reasons why we're all here today and we now have a wonderful panel including matt's up cousin I he said he didn't pay her for all of those product placements um, to look at the socio-technical innovations that can, can help us combat gambling harm. So can I welcome to the podium, Chris May. There he is. Hi, Chris. And Ruth Persian. 
and Matt Sarb-Cousins and Jamie Wheaton. So, first up we have Chris May. Chris is the Founder and Managing Director of Maiden Health Tech Solutions. And he's going to be talking about a data-driven approach to tackling gambling harms. So Chris May's digital healthcare company is based in Bath. I've been to visit it, very lovely. Um, Chris used to be from a manufacturing background, but the last 33 years of his career has been in the healthcare sector. And he's passionate about maximizing the opportunities presented by the information age, both to provide joined up healthcare, improve patient outcomes, and to increase cost-effective healthcare IT. Uh, Chris's company is also very interesting because it has a flat management structure. They've just written a book called Made Without Management, which I would recommend to read. And that's not on my notes, and he didn't ask me. <laughs> so I will hand over to Chris to give us his perspective. Thank you. Thanks, Agnes. Um... As Agnes said, uh, we're based in Bath, we're a health tech company. Um, our biggest product and the main area of focus at the moment uh, is uh, the product called IAPTUS. And it's a patient management system uh, which uh, currently uh, supports about 230 services, um, including about three quarters of the NHS's psychological therapy services for adults, about 70 children's mental health services, um, and uh, similarly, adult services around the world in Canada, Australia, and shortly a big children's service in Ireland. Um, more recently, in the last couple of years, we've moved into what we call adjacent clinical services, uh, such as diabetes remission, cardiovascular disease prevention. And we've also, um, our system is also supporting some of the emerging uh, gambling arms clinics that uh, are just being set up. Um, some of those clinics, not all of those clinics. Um, and at this point, I feel like a celebrity on a talk show um, who's supposed to be here to talk about something, but has just mentioned the fact that they've just published a book. So, uh, um, but, uh, so my, my key thing is data, and I can talk about that for hours. When it comes to gambling harms, I have to admit, I've got a big dose of imposter syndrome sitting here today. Um, and I've had to do a lot of um, catching up and I've learned a lot today from the other speakers. So thank you for that. Um, but I've also had to evaluate my own uh, kind of relationship with gambling. And um, I've never bought a lottery ticket. Um, I quite often get invited to these charity events where more often than not these days, there is a casino in a room somewhere and you get some free chips with your ticket. I run a mile from them. I always give my chips to someone else and go in the opposite direction. Um, but then I realized actually that I do take big bets. Uh, I will buy a house without doing a survey. Um, I got married after six dates. Uh, that one didn't work out that well. Um, you know, I have um, invested in the stock market at a time of high volatility. And I've also come to the conclusion that actually you can't run a successful business without taking some risks. So it's not that I'm not a risk taker at all. Um, but th this whole thing has made me think about that. Um, one of the, um, the big risks that we're taking now is what I actually want to talk to you uh, about today. But first of all, just a couple of facts. The gambling industry, um, I have learned in the UK, um, generates £14 billion of gross profit every year. Um, a quarter of that profit is made from 1% of the accounts um, within the gambling uh, 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 companies. Um, and half of that gross profit is made from 5% of those user accounts. Um, and that tells me two things. First of all, um, if you've got 14 billion pounds of profit every year to spend, you can buy the best mathematicians, the best psychologists, the best software developers, and the best data scientists. And data is key to this because with that data, um, you can actually create a very positive reinforcement cycle for what your industry is about. So right now today, with all of that talent and all of those skills and all of the data that they're collecting on a daily basis or you know, minute by minute, um, they know who you are, um, what to target you with, and how to target you with. So if they're using data in that way, we have to be smart and use data as well to um, 
uh, to combat it. So on the screen now, you should see um, what is a, um, a very simple equation. And, uh, and, and what it basically says is that uh, in any clinical service, the patient who comes in, the first thing you will do is you will do some kind of assessment and you will build up a profile of, of that service user, addict, patient, or whatever. Um, you would then um, talk with the, the user. Are we not on that? Oh, sorry. Um, um, we'll then talk um, with that uh, uh, service user about the treatment options. Um, our system uh, primarily has CBT, uh, but lots of different therapies are included in, in IAPTUS. Um, and I believe CBT is widely used in, in gambling addiction services as well. Um, and we will send them on a treatment pathway with the aim of getting some kind of outcome at the end. Now, you might think, and I'm you know, well, that's not rocket science. Surely that's what all clinical services do. But that is not the case. Um, starting from the right of this equation, you'll be surprised um, that actually very few health services measure outcomes. Um, if you've had a hip replacement, um, that is treated as an outcome. You've left the hospital with a new hip. It's not an outcome. It's an input. And what doesn't get measured is, have you actually been able to walk away from that hospital appointment or that surgery? Um, being able to walk freely and without pain. That's a bit that doesn't get ma ma uh, measured or recorded. So measuring outcomes is something which health services across the world are really bad at. Um, we don't systematize the treatment um, options. Um, we're very, very good at giving patients a very personal service and we want to treat every patient as individual. Um, but um, we actually miss a trick there because actually there's lots of commonality between the treatments that we give to patients and we need to learn from that. But most importantly, at this stage, in terms of um, tackling the industry, is we're not necessarily building up um, really good profiles of the people that we're treating. Um, there are too many free text boxes in our system, which we need to get rid of. Free text boxes are a nightmare for researchers, and there are lots of researchers in the room whose actual job is hampered by the fact that there's just all this free text, and where was, things should be kind of in, in systematized fields. And once you've kind of built up a profile using, um, you know, structured data sets, then you can do lots of things. First of all, you can compare all of the populations of patients you're looking at. You can start to understand exactly who they are, where they're coming from, what their social economic status is, and all kinds of stuff about them, and start to draw patterns, which can not only be used to optimize the treatment pathways, but can also be used to even target prevention in the first place. So, um, it's, it's just really important that we do that. But also, um, uh, if Agnes was a, a new service user and came into my clinic, I would build up this profile. And once we get this right, I will build up a profile of Agnes. And then I would be able to find all of the other Agneses in the database, look at the treatment pathways that they went on and the outcomes that they got. And I would be able to recommend to Agnes the best treatment pathway that the data is telling me um, we, we can use for Ag Agnes to basically get her the best outcome. So in a nutshell, we need to get much better at profiling um, the, the, the service users that we're seeing, the addicts we're seeing, so that we really understand what's going on, make sure that we kind of um, you know, understand that the, the, the pathways, the treatment pathways that we're using, and that we measure the outcomes in order to optimize those pathways for all the addicts, addicts that are gonna come through our doors in the future. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'd, I'd love to meet the other Agnes's. But that's a, a really, really interesting view on, on data and how the gambling companies, of course, have been using the data in a very sophisticated way, but perhaps by no, doing it similarly. <laughs> and it was right on seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Ruth Persian, and she's the Principal Advisor for Financial Behaviour and Gambling Research at the Behavioural Insights Team. And her talk, not surprisingly, is on using behavioural insights uh, to mitigate gambling harm. So Ruth heads up the Behavioural Insights Team Gambling Policy Research Unit, uh, which is a four-year programme that's funded by the regulatory settlement from the Gambling Commission. And the unit conducts all sorts of research to reduce harm from gambling and to make the UK gambling market the most safely regulated market in the world. So without further ado, I will hand over to Ruth. 
Thanks so much. Yeah, and as you already said, um, I'll be speaking about how we can use behavioral insights um, to reduce gambling harm um, based on our work in the Gambling Policy and Research Unit, the GPIU. We started in 2021, so we're now sort of two years into our program of work and have some first results, which I will speak about. And um, our objective is to understand and reduce gambling harm and feed into policy making things like the white paper responding to consultations. And we do so through exploratory research and designing and testing rigorously um, solutions to reduce gambling harm. And this is really what Behavioral Insights is about in general. Um, it's an approach that draws on evidence from the behavioral sciences, so from sort of more academic research in social psychology and in behavioral economics and neuroscience, and then applies this evidence to practical challenges, to, to challenges like gambling harm. Um, it also has this focus on using scientific methods, so on, on producing new evidence, um, and that's very much based on a realization that human behavior, which is what we're trying to understand and to to sort of support positive human behavior is very context specific. So just because something works in one context doesn't necessarily mean it, it also works in, an, in another context. Um, and in the next six minutes or so, I'll be sharing two examples of our most recent work. Um, one is, is a lab experiment that we've just concluded and where we have all the data and the results and we'll be publishing it shortly. Um, and then the other one is an ongoing, um, an ongoing experiment. Great. Um, so the first case study or example is um, focusing on activity statements. And activity statements are essentially, for those of you not familiar with it, an overview of an individual's gambling behavior, money spent, time spent over a given period of time. So say, for example, a month. And the idea is that it can reduce harm by helping people gain a better understanding of how much time and money they have spent on gambling and then adjust their behavior accordingly. So if they realize they've spent a little bit more money or time than they would ideally want to, um, that gives them the tool to, to then adjust it. Um, they're now man mandatory in Australia. Um, their gambling customers have to be sent such a statement via email once a month. But in the UK, they're not currently implemented. There's one operator that um, gives their customers access to, to a similar statement, but um, you have to go into your account to see it. So what we were interested in is to test the impact on um, that such a statement might have on someone's gambling, um, and then also on the recall, recall of their own um, gambling behavior. And what you can see on the slide is the four different versions of an activity statement that we tested in our online lab, lab experiment on our own platform that we tested against a um, what we call a no, no statement control, so um, against no, no statement at all. And um, just very briefly, the four different statements that we tested was one baseline, which is very much based on the one that um, the Australian government has, has sort of mandated. Then the industry um, statement is very similar to the one that's currently available to um, made available by one of the operators in, in Great Britain. Um, the prediction correction arm was based on the idea that people are very bad at, at sort of remembering um, how much they've bet, how much money and time they've spent. And in this treatment, we asked people to guess how much time and money they'd spent, money especially, um, in, in this online experiment and then gave them a correction in the statement, told them you've under or overestimated your, your gambling by this and this amount. And the last one was a call to action where we asked people to set up a deposit limit, again, in this lab environment um, following the statement. So um, what we were interested in was, as I already said, gambling behavior. So we asked people to play a slot game um, in, in our lab environment over several rounds. And then also we tested their recall of their own behavior within this experiment. So we asked them, how much money do you think you've spent? What we found that there were was that there were some differences across the different arms. So they all performed slightly differently on the different outcome measures. But across all the different activity statements, we saw an, a significant improvement in recall. So people were a lot better at, at sort of remembering later on how much they'd actually bet. Um, and as, as I already said, that was one of the that's one of the ideas really behind activity statements that it gives people this extra information, this extra transparency. 
Um, so yeah, that's sort of the conclusion that activity statements help people um, potentially to make better informed decisions about their, their gambling. And we also saw a small but significant reduction in the total value bet and then also the average stake per round. And what I think is quite interesting, both for operators, but also policymakers, is that 88% of the participants in our experiment thought that um, these statements should be implemented by operators. So there's a lot of openness and a lot of support for that. And roughly 90% also thought that they were very informative and, and easy to understand across, again, across the different versions. So that's the first case study. Just very briefly, um, the ongoing experiment. This time looking at what banks can do to support um, customers. So this is testing the idea for spending limits. So um, operators are already offering deposit limits, so people can, can restrict how much they can deposit. And But this is by gambling operator. Banks, on the other hand, offer um, quite a lot of them offer gambling blocks, but that's very black and white. So it's either you, you can spend as much as you want or you don't spend at all on your debit card. And our idea is to test different versions of um, a spending limit, which would basically combine the two ideas. And I'm just um, on this slide, we just got two examples, um, which use different ideas from the behavioral sciences um, in this gambling block, uh, sorry, in the spending limit setup. Um, and what we're testing at the moment is whether, again, in a lab environment, people are more likely to take up or say they would take up such a, such a spending limit compared to just a normal gambling block. Um, and then also, uh, we are looking at whether people um, set, quote unquote, sensible limits. So whether they set limits that, um, yeah, that, that mean they, they're gambling within their means. Um, we've just finished data collection on this, so we should have results quite shortly. But yeah, thank you very much. And very happy to speak about this uh, later if anyone interested. Brilliant, thank you very much. So we've looked at data to help treatment providers and now we've looked at data to help to help well it will come from the operators to help people curb their their gambling or or perhaps the banks will await the results of your of your study with great interest so thank you very much um our next speaker is um Matt Zarpas, who's already been introduced by carolyn um, he's the founder and ceo of gamban and matt's going to talk to us about the efficacy of layered self-exclusion um, thank you Thanks very much, um, and for the invitation. Uh, so I'm down as being from Clean Up Gambling, but I, as has been mentioned, I, I co-founded Gamban. Gamban is software that um, is installed by a user onto their devices, and it blocks access to more than 65,000 gambling sites and apps worldwide with a block list that's updated daily. And this includes unregulated sites and apps, um, as well as day trading and crypto platforms, which aren't regulated as gambling, but are associated with gambling harm. It's available on all major platforms and designed to be as difficult to remove as the various operating systems will allow. So in, in December 2020, Gamban partnered with Gamcare, which operates the National Gambling Helpline and, uh, and the treatment services, and with Gamstop, the self-exclusion scheme for licensed operators in Britain. And we formed Talkban Stop, which promotes a layered approach to self-exclusion by allowing all UK residents to download Gamban free of charge through the National Gambling Helpline. The pilot phase for this was funded by the Gambling Commission um, through a regulatory settlement, and the project is now supported by GambleAware. Um, the financial sector can play a really important role in the identif identification of harmful gambling behaviour. Uh, banks can reinforce the layered approach by offering the gambling transaction block, and signposting to talk ban stop, which is what many of them do. This allows users to opt out of any online gambling transactions via their bank accounts. If a user chooses to switch gambling transaction blocks on, some banks are often offer, often, um, offer a delay period that adds to the friction of the layered approach. Um, the talk ban stop project, which promotes putting as many barriers as possible in place for people that want to self-exclude and quit gambling, quit online gambling particularly, um, has been evaluated by Ipsos Mori and KPMG, and I'll summarize some of the findings. So according to KPMG, the project has had a gross impact of between 3.8 million and 11.7 million pounds in reducing costs to the UK government and wider society. Um, free Gamban licenses through the Talkban Stop campaign generated between 1.4 million and 3 million pounds in reduced costs to the government and wider society in terms of 
uh, in net terms based on the estimates by IPPR and 1.9 million using Public Health England's estimate. Um, so based on these costs, it's had a net return on investment uh, for the country. Um, uh, KPMG also asked users to compare the average gambling-related financial losses within 12 months before utilising a layered approach to self-exclusion and the average losses during the 12 months after they'd installed Gamban and completed all the steps. And the survey respondents who had used the layered approach reported an average of £5,843 in reduction in annual gambling-related financial losses. So when scaled up to the number of users who installed free Gamban uh, through the Talk Band Stop campaign, KPMG estimated that around £44.6 million in gambling-related financial losses were avoided in the appraisal period from December 2020 to July 2022. 32% of the respondents would not have used gambling blocking software had that not been offered for free through Talk Band Stop. And this is why we have exported this notion of a layered approach to other jurisdictions abroad, where Gamban is now offered for free at the point of use or point of need in Ohio through Time Out Ohio, in Norway via the Norwegian monopoly Norse Tipping, and via the Finnish monopoly Veikaus. We want to emulate this recovery model in as many jurisdictions as possible. And with our user data, we have the capacity to review and evaluate its efficacy on an ongoing basis. And new product developments are about to be launched, which I am happy to share with anyone who is interested. Um, what these seek to do is gamify recovery and the process of recovery um, more. So things like incentives, badges, offers, um, tracking how much someone has uh, saved while they've installed, while they've had Gamban installed, uh, days since they've gambled. And obviously, we want to be able to optimize this so um, we can theoretically figure out the best way to route someone into treatment. So because we're in a position where we can recontact people once they've downloaded Gamban because they've got an app on their device that's difficult to remove, uh, when's the best time to send someone a push notification to say, have you considered calling the relevant jurisdiction or national gambling helpline or have you considered doing therapy? So there's lots of things we could do in that regard. And I think I was really kind of inspired by the way in which um, lots of people I've spoken to in recovery. I'm in recovery myself from 13 years ago. I gave up gambling. I was addicted to fixed odds betting terminals. Um, uh, people in Gamblers Anonymous meetings, they always say that they get addicted to recovery. Now, you might think that's a slightly unusual turn of phrase, but I think that that's what it is. I think the process of recovery is another form of addiction for lots of people, and that's what keeps them in recovery. And I think we have to try to utilize that, try to harness that, that person is trying to displace that activity with something else. For me, it was politics. It didn't turn out particularly well, um, but uh, um, I, I did. I spent all the time I spent gambling on, on something else. Um, and I think the idea of being able to gamify that recovery process to make that a, an addiction in itself or make that something that someone can actually like, hang on to um, rather than going and resorting to gambling, I think that's all very interesting. So. We want to use technology in the same way the industry uses technology to, to maximize profit. We want to use it to harness it to its fullest potential to, to benefit recovery. And uh, we think we can do that. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping that there are more and more solutions like ours will, will emerge in the coming years. Thanks. Thanks so much, Matt. That's, that's fascinating. So we've got three very different uses of technology, but all to, to try and help people along the way. And uh, great to hear the evaluation you did of your, your product as well. That's um, really impressive. Thank you. And you said you're in three countries at the moment. Well, I think you've got 13 countries in the room. So maybe, you know, a little bit of marketing push for you there too. So, um, thank you. Um, our final speaker is Jamie Wheaton, and he is the research associate here at the Bristol Hub for Gambling Harms Research. And he's just finished a uh, a scoping review looking at, at this whole area of um, socio-technical um, uses. Um, so he's going. his talk is the future regulation and application of socio-technical innovations in the gambling industry. Take it away, Jamie. Thanks, Agnes. Um, thank you to Agnes. Thanks to Sharon for inviting me to speak and thank you all for coming. Um, as Agnes has mentioned, I'm a research associate here at the Hub working on this challenge. I also have a background in uh, working in betting shops previously before doing my PhD research um, in the digital transformation of betting shops. And this talk, which will focus on how we can apply socio-technical innovations across the sector is very much formed as a 
kind of amalgamation of that work. Um, so I should therefore mention that through my work at the Hub, I've researched funding, I've received research funding from Gambleware, but Gambleware hasn't research, influenced my research activities or decisions in any way. I'll put my teeth in in a minute. Um, I want to start by taking a step back and asking what is a socio-technical innovation? So socio-technical innovation in layman's terms is a system or product which is designed to fulfill specific functions, in this case, gambling. Now, these innovations emerge from three key stages which are constantly evolving. So firstly, we have the emergence of technology. Secondly, we have the interaction between technology and the stakeholder, which wants to, um, I guess, enact the affordances or make the, the reality, the possibilities of that technology come true. And then thirdly, which is the important area for me, is the interaction between the use of that technology and guiding rules, norms, or standards. I, does this new technology influence new rules or is the new technology being used within existing rules or stand, existing rules or standards? My key question here is who is setting the standards in, within this third step? Who is, this, who is setting the, the rules or standards or norms when we're using socio-technical innovations across the gambling sector? Now, there are so many socio-technical innovations across the, the industry, and it's impossible to cover them all in just under seven minutes. So I'm going to hopefully pick a select few to demonstrate my point that there are a wide range of innovations which require regulation. And only one stakeholder would be capable of regulating them all across that gambling journey, guided by the principle that we should be prioritizing the prevention of gambling harms rather than profitability. So firstly, the products themselves are examples of socio-technical innovations, whether that's fixed odds betting terminals, in play betting, which is offered by the quantification of sports online slots as well. And we know that more products are harmful than others, such as slot based products. So the higher the event frequency, the larger the number of spins, games or gambles, which can be played in a session. And we also have evidence that highlights the faster the speed of play, the lower the ability to accurately recall the money spent in a session. Other product features are available, but I pick the speed of play just as one to demonstrate my point. So what can we do to make products more safe well we can reduce the speed of play we can introduce a minimum time between spins which therefore increases friction and increases thinking time to hopefully encourage a bit more thinking time between spins and hopefully reduce the number of spins in a session and reduce the um, money lost and we've done that before we've done we've as uh, lord foster said earlier we've introduced a minimum of a maximum of two pound stake on fixed odds betting terminals and we've removed credit credit card withdrawals from online gambling as well so that is possible. We've demonstrated that is possible. A further socio-technical innovation, which is, um, I guess, enabled by the digital transformation of the betting industry, is that related to surveillance. Now, Rob Davies um, mentioned earlier, and I should highlight that there's going to be a lot of overlap with what's already been said with what I'm saying, is that the key business model or key function of the business model of the gambling industry today is that of surveillance. Whether you're in shops or if you're online, they will use whatever means of surveillance they have, whether that's through membership cards or maybe just your online membership to gather as much data as they can about your spend. So we know that the digital transformation of gambling products allows data to spend, but we also know that it allows a track of customer behavior in order to monitor for potential harmful gambling behaviors. And we have technology which deploys red flags, which can signify this to the operator and research by Michael Auer and researchers such as Michael Auer or Mark Griffiths, demonstrates that personalized feedback or social responsibility interactions, which can arise from these red flags, can reduce theoretical losses which may have been made in the future, or indeed money spent, depending on the jurisdiction, whether that's the studies have been conducted in the Netherlands and in the Norway, which demonstrate that these social responsibility contact, uh, contacts can have a positive impact. However, in the UK, the patterns of play report by the University of Liverpool and uh, Natsen found that only 3.9% of customers received a social responsibility contact in 2018 and 2019, and 0.13% of customers were contacted via telephone. Now, you might ask, what is the issue with this? Well, we know from, uh, from continued gambling commission enforcement cases, that interaction by operators with those who may be displaying harmful, two minutes already, okay, um, <laughs> displaying harmful behaviors is already inadequate. Uh, one uh, operator, UK-based operator, was fined just this July for having insufficient controls, I quote, insufficient controls in place to protect new customers and to monitor high velocity speed 
and duration of play, exposing the customer to the risk of substantial losses is losses without safer gambling interaction, along with a lack of the evidence of the effectiveness of customer interactions. So basically I'm asking, we have the ability to track gambling behavior, we have the ability to interact, but we have to ask questions over whether operator practices, when they're motivated by profitability, over the tracking of cut behaviors requires further legislation. Should we be more guided by a norms which seeks to prevent gambling harms in the first place in order to enact some sort of duty of care? And then I haven't got very long left, so I'm going to try and speed through the rest of it. The development of associated technical innovations means that messaging can also occur during gameplay itself. And I, Joe Lars was talking earlier about uh, betting shops. I had flashbacks to working in betting shops and seeing when the fun stops stop um, flash across uh, the top of fixed odds betting terminals. Um, we, we, we know that we have a mixed evidence base on recall percentages and whether participants in randomized control trials recall the contents of responsible gambling messages. And they might have a small belief, impact on beliefs about outcomes depending on the message. But messages which inform customers about the risks of gambling or chances of winning or losing can amend beliefs on behavior as well. Yet responsible gambling messaging at the moment is developed by industry. Now the industry will argue this messaging empowers customers into safer gambling behaviors for the usage of the limits and reality checks. And as true, the patterns of pay report found that at 21.5% of the 140,000 online accounts use deposit limits. But it is a condition of the license that the customers are aware of these limits. Safer gambling terminology problematizes those who are experiencing harmful gambling behaviors or addiction and fails to address product design or operator practice. Again, we need to be guided by the, uh, thank you. We need to be guided by the norms that we need to be presenting, uh, preventing gambling harms from occurring in the first place. And I was really pleased to see that the white paper has highlighted the intention to develop health-based messaging, advising on the risks of gambling, as opposed to kind of when the fun stops, stop, for example. Um, I was going to talk um, very briefly about forms of treatment as a form of socio-technical innovation, but I've been timed up. So I'll just briefly um, summarize by saying that I've tried to take a whistle-stop tour through just a select few socio-technical innovations in the sector, and there is a common theme. These would be uh, best regulated by central, by central legislation, but guided by the overarching principle of the prevention of gambling harms. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Jamie. That was a really you know fantastic overview of the of the whole issue of um the interaction between technology regulations and norms i thank you very much for that so we've got some some time for questions i've got a couple on the slider before we go to the floor um first one is for chris and it's uh, from colin walsh who says how would you propose measuring the long-term efficacy of treatment and support given the recent data showing an 87 percent relapse rate at PGSI 8 plus, so um, problem high on the problem gambling score. It's a tough one, isn't it? Because you, um, you, you, you go through a course of CBT or whatever, and you think you've kind of got a result, and then um, the service user kind of goes back, and you think, okay, they're, they're cured of their gambling addiction, but actually they're not. Um, and so, and we have this problem in all the services we look at, you know, it's, it's what happens over the long term. Uh, what happens in uh, an IAPS, so an NHS talking therapy service or psychological therapy service is they usually have these six month mm -hmm. um, checks. And so there's an automatic thing that says, okay, we just want to check up on you and see how you are at the moment. Um, and I think that's the only way you can really do it is to basically say when the, when that course of CBT is over, it's actually not over. Yeah, you've got to. Yeah, and you would build that into your, yeah. your new software. You, you, build it, you build it into your care pathway and say, yeah. okay, there is a stop, and then there is a six-month gap, and then there is a check-in. And might there be different groups of people you're talking about who might need three-month check, and oh, others who might need a one-month check, and others that are fine with a six-month check? When, when I talk about treatment pathways, um, it just sounds like it's, a, you know, it can actually be about even the kind of, you know, which clinician they have. Is it a male or female clinician? Um, it's kind of how many sessions they will need to get to, a, you know, get a result. So you're looking at all different kinds of variables, you know, quite a, a degree of granularity. So absolutely, those check-ins could be three months, six months annually, depending on what that that user group needs, uh, basically. And that's what you use the data for. Yeah, 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 exactly. 
fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, this is one for Jamie. Um, can socio-technical innovations be used to prevent people from buying scratch cards in supermarkets, given that you can use a credit card for do so? That's a very good question. I might come to Ruth on that one as well. Uh, okay. I guess the use of credit, again, it depends. You could, you could use socio-technical innovations such as, um, you know, locks on debit and credit cards, for example, if you can expand those to national lottery tickets. I guess the issue then would come down to how you would itemise those national lottery tickets if you were going to a supermarket to buy them in the first place. There's always a way. I think a lot of it comes down to how we segment those gambling products in terms of how they're sold at points of sale, how they can be recorded as a financial transaction, and also the messaging around that as well. Do you want to add anything on that, Ruth, from a sort of behavioural insights point of view? Sure, yeah. So I think, as you already said, there's a bit of a challenge with, for example, using something like spending limits because it's normally not itemized. So the merchant code, which is what my understanding is um, gambling blocks use, um, it's just going to be your local supermarket or your local corner store. So that won't work. Um, I think there's something around messaging, so which could be um, used offline. We haven't really looked into that, but there could be something around social norms. So if you want to, um, if you want to encourage people to keep their spending within a certain limit, um, then, then you could have social norms messaging around this. Um, there could be could be other things, but yeah, um, it's it's a bit more of a challenging challenge. But yeah, no. uh, just from a policy perspective, uh, the um, only ten percent of scratch card revenue goes to good causes, compared to thirty percent of draw revenue. And one of the reasons that all win won the national lottery from Camelot is because they wanted to move away from scratch cards and focus more again on the draw based games. The, the solution from a policy perspective, if you can't block access to scratch cards because they're in supermarkets, is to limit the state, limit the, num the amount you can bet on the scratch cards, which is, at the moment, you know, there, there are £20 scratch cards off, which is absolutely obscene. Um, so I think, you know, £1 or the same, at least the same as uh, a national lottery ticket. Any questions? Hi, uh, Dimitrios Torrens is from Gumcare. Uh, I've got a question for um, for Ruth. Uh, just just going back, going back to your uh, presentation on the activity statements. Maybe I've missed it, but I wonder whether you measure uh, as your end outcomes intention to treatment. No, we didn't look at that. Sorry, I'm just looking at my colleague. We didn't look at intention to treatment. Didn't we? No, no, we looked at um, behavior within the lab experiment. So, um, yeah, as I said, we we asked people to to play, um, and then we also looked at um, their ability to recall um, accurately. We did try and um, do some segmentation by um, PGSI. Um, so we asked people about their sort of a short form PGSI, and um, but we didn't ask about treatment. No. Also important to say, this was a lab experiment. We are very much hoping to take this to, to operators to work with them on, on field experiments, and then that might be an interesting outcome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, just a comment on machine learning algorithms, which ought to be being used currently to identify problem gambling and take action. Um, in the inquest of Luke Ashton a few months ago, Betfair uh, had a machine learning algorithm with some like 270 parameters in it, uh, which is a reasonable model. I think PwC identified 200 markers for harm. Crack Labs identified about 186 different pieces of data on an individual. So that ought to have helped. But the model was calibrated to pick out 2.1% of their exchange betting customers, whereas the real world prevalence of harm there was 5.4% of problem gamblers and 12% of uh, at-risk gamblers, so it should have been picking up 18%. Uh, they hadn't calibrated it to the real world. I could see no evidence that it was independently audited, uh, and I think they had no incentive to use it properly to minimise harm. They wanted to maximise profits. And in effect, cynically, I would suspect it was used as a tick box exercise to satisfy a gambling commission. Um, can you offer any hope of those models being used effectively uh, to prevent harm rather than maximise profits? And second quick point, banks are the other organisations who can see harmful spend happening live. 
they're very reluctant to get involved, uh, even though they've recently got a FCA duty of care to protect the vulnerable. Uh, as a minimum, I would have hoped they could have anonymised data to inform the public debate like NatWest did uh, three or four years ago when they had 10% of 750,000 current accounts spending more than 25% of income on gambling. A time series of that would track whether regulation was working or not. And the work by Muggleton et al. with Lloyds Bank and others also had some useful insights, but then the access to data was shut. So can you see a way to drag banks kicking and screaming into the harm prevention game? Thank you. Rather than banks, would anyone like to take either of those points? I can have a go at algorithms. Um, I looked at Luke's case when I was preparing the talk, and I looked at what the operator said afterwards when the verdict was given, and they said that we hold ourselves to the absolute highest standards in the industry. I will, of course, incorporate additional learnings from this tragic case into our systems and processes. I try not to be cynical. But when they've got all those data points already available to them and they failed in this case, the only thing that I think that will offer any sort of hope would be a properly resourced legislator or gambling commission which would have live access to that data. Someone mentioned earlier about an independent view of customers which would have live access to all these data markers and would therefore would be able to pinpoint exactly who needs help. That would be that would give me hope. Um, but again, I'm trying not to be cynical. So, uh, yes. Thank you. Anyone want to take the point on the bank? No, I'm going to do two, maybe. Um, so, I, yeah, I totally agree. I think banks have now, especially with the new consumer duty that was implemented about two, three months ago, um, a duty to also look at harm from, from gambling, financial harm especially. Um, and we know that some of the banks do use data to um, to identify potentially harmful gambling, but I um, I agree that you know there could be much more done. And I think sometimes my my sense is from speaking to some of the banks is there are the data teams um, which are also focused a lot on marketing, essentially on marketing products. Um, and then there are the vulnerable customer teams, and there's sometimes a bit of a disconnect, I think. And maybe that, hopefully that will change, especially with the FCA, putting a lot more emphasis on, on outcomes and looking at us very carefully and on data and banks having to monitor outcomes. Um, but I think there is, there's currently, to my sense, a little bit of a disconnect. Thanks very much. So, time's up. Can we all put our hands together for a magnificent panel?